Joanna Carrick, there are these three plays plus a little short one, which we'll come to. And I think we should sort of take them through a bit in historical order, but let's start with Anne Boleyn. Let me ask you, what got you going on this Tudor and Reformation trail? What started it? I don't know, I was thinking about this and I think it was, it was actually slightly hubristic, wasn't it? Just to suddenly think, oh, out of the blue, I can write a play about Anne Boleyn. Um, I'd written a play about Thomas Clarkson, the abolitionist, and I loved that project and it was really one of the first things I'd written and I was getting very excited about the idea. And I just thought one day, well, I think I'd like to write about Anne Boleyn now, um, quite <laughs> naively really. Um, but I was thinking about local links and as a child I'd been really fascinated by the Irwerton church story about Anne Boleyn's heart being buried in the church and because uh, we used to live at Pin Mill near there when I was very little and uh, in that village you've got the Boleyn Close and the Queen's Head pub and that got me thinking from a very early age, I think I was interested as most people are, most girls are interested in Anne Boleyn. And a friend of mine lived in Irwerton Hall. So I got to go in there and she said that it was haunted. Anne Boleyn's aunt and uncle used to live there and Anne Boleyn used to visit there. So I had a little bit of a local link and I didn't know very much about her. And I decided to find out. And that's where I started from. But it was very much the idea that she and her brother had been accused of incest and that was the grounds for their execution, which I found as a fascinating starting point. So exploring that relationship and of course we don't know the truth of their relationship, but there must have been something so intensely close about their relationship as brother and sister, I think, that made it in some way plausible for them to have been accused of having an incestuous relationship. So that's well, in a way my starting point. It's a nice quirky thing to make it a two-hander uh, with just her, all you ever see is Anne and her brother at intervals through this sort of four or five years where she's, you know, she, she's sort of a bit ambitious, a bit interested, a bit romantic. They're both very young, they're both very larky and it goes right through. And so all these figures kind of are on the outside of it. Henry's on the outside, Thomas Cromwell's on the outside, the Queen, you know, Seymour near the end. They're, they're all closing in on these two. And in a way, I think the brother-sister thing to me is what made it so moving because that's the one place you're sort of a bit safe is with your sibling. You know, you've grown up together, you know each other from the very beginning. Um, and all these kind of pearl headdresses and pomp and field of the cloth of gold is all outside. And so that, that in a way makes it so cosy. And then they end up on, on the scaffold together in, in the final scene. And um, you, you just feel this is the world crushing in on these two siblings. You, the, about their characters, that interested me that she's, you make her very girlish, idealistic, rather religious from the very beginning, you know, believing, utterly believing. And he suddenly caught a fire with this whole business of down with popery, down with the corruption of the monasteries. Um, is, how, how much do we really know that? Do we, don't we know about these kind of passionate depths of their feelings? Do we have it on paper as it were? Yes, I think, I think so. Um, there, it's well documented that she was passionate about the idea of the dissolution of the monasteries being something that could be used for good. Um, of course, there's this coming together of your personal ambition with something that very conveniently is actually going to be for everybody's benefit. Um, and I think they're they're in a way guilty of that of that crime of in a way manipulating circumstances to suit their ends both inwardly as well as outwardly um and i think yeah they're, I, that false face must hide what the false heart does know <laughs> around in my head because it seems to me that this as you were saying this is the one place where they can show their feelings so, and this and this, this Anne, your Anne, is in love with Henry, though. I mean, I, I sort of believe that. She was, she, she's infatuated with his power and his glory. And it must remember, he's still quite young. 
tongue. He's not that great huge tub of lard that we see in Holbein, right. uh, all covered in jewels. You know, he's still young and jousting. And yes. she is, she's, she's pretty thrilled with the whole thing, isn't she? Yes. Um, well, we, getting rid of the Spaniard. She is basically the other woman. We have to admit she is getting rid, getting rid of the Spaniard. Absolutely. And, and, and what, what you don't realise until you start looking into it is that Catherine of Aragon had been married to Henry for something like 20 years. This she is made a... his shirts. It's an extraordinary bit where Anne <laughs> says, you know, she's more of a mother than a wife to him. She's making his shirts and she's all outraged by this and it's absolutely documented that's the most wonderful bit in the play and uh, when i was working with the women coming away from prostitution and drug addiction uh, around this story that was the bit that ignited their excitement they just loved it the bit about about his ex-wife still making his shirt so in modern improvisations it was oh he goes around to his ex-wife every morning and picks up his packed lunch um, he does his ironing <laughs> and all the different paradigms that they Got with this guy still still kind of tied in with his marriage because of his of his needs and I also I really like that when I was rehearsing it with with Piers and Scott the other day but the, the bit where it, he um her brother George just doesn't get it so okay well oh he like he just likes his shirts like that he, he can't understand why I'm <laughs> so affronted and so so angry about it. How easy was it for you to in all these plays, but I mean, especially starting with this one, to get yourself into a mindset of understanding this absolute partisan fanaticism, you know, this urgency to get rid of the popish trash, of the corruption, and the, 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 the passion around there. We've just been through this extraordinary divided families business of Brexit, which is like a playground squabble in comparison. Um, and even that has split families up and made people not speak to each other and so on. But how, how easy was it for you? I mean, do you have a, a religious background enough to to be as serious, as, as impassioned as your characters are? Can you, can you get into that in your head? I can get into it. I don't have the background at all. Um, but I can get into it. And I think that was my mission to do this, was to put myself into their shoes in terms of, yes, being brought up with this fanatic sense of absolute belief. And also, in order to make such an enormous U-turn to reject the Pope, you're, you're risking your immortal soul. So, you've got, in order to get your head into that, you've got to believe completely in the, in the immortal soul, you've got to believe in heaven, and you've got to believe in hell. Um, and if you do that, if you commit completely to doing that, then these things matter enormously. Um, and even if you can commit yourself 99% to the cause and believe in what you're doing, you're still going to have that little nagging doubt inside because you were brought up to it. It's like the Jesuits give me a child before he's seven years old and he'll be mine for life. So that was my mindset. These people are brought up to it. And looking at the art and looking at, at the things that they were taught from being tiny, but it's so important to be able to do that as a playwright and as a director as well, isn't it? I remember being infuriated by um, a, a Dr. Faustus once, which was really done for laughs. And I thought, no, 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 you cannot do Dr. Faustus unless you really, really believe that you might for all eternity be damned. Mm. Because you've got to learn to believe it. And, and sometimes young directors just can't quite get into that. They can't quite believe in the devil. But you've got to believe in heaven, hell, and the four last things, haven't you? You've got to make your own head believe it to get speeches like that extraordinary rant of George's and indeed of their, their scaffold speeches. I hope I will be in heaven with you this day. You know, there's some, it's that belief. Um, the other thing which comes out of it, of course, which comes out very strongly in Mantell, Hilary Mantell's Wolf Hall trilogy, is, um, God, the women, I mean, what, what Anne went through, three miscarriages, as well as the birth of Elizabeth, and the, the dread, the terror surrounding all that. You're heavily pregnant, you're exhausted. This came out very strongly in the stage performance. You know, she, she just was a woman being driven desperate. I mean, it, 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 did feminist urges come over you at any stage in this, or just human, human decency urges? <laughs> it's hard not to. And, and really for a brilliant young woman as she was clearly the only ambition the only route open to her was through 
who she married or if she decided to become someone's mistress. And then once she's done that, the whole thing hinges entirely on childbirth and a male child. So these things, the, the, the tension and the pressure and the fear, the enormous rate of, of women who died in childbirth. And then the conviction basically that it might be a curse put on her for rejecting the popish ways. And it could be basically not quite the monks doing it all, but that would always be the back of your head. No. And this, this sort of brings us on, can we go on to the, the other two, the other two de plays? Um, first of all, to go to put out the lights, which two years, two years later, I think, and Anne's dead. And so is poor Jane Seymour. And Cromwell has sent these heavies down to destroy the Catholic shrine and the statue of Our Lady in Ipswich. And you this time put it mainly among the ordinary people, in fact, entirely among the ordinary people outside the court. Again, was this another a thought, a switch in your head? You thought, gosh, what all these people were doing was changing lives in Ipswich. I think, so. I think it's the same thing in a way of just thinking about this woman and the really radical actions that she took in her life, the extraordinary kind of almost ludicrous bravery of Alice Driver, who didn't have to burn at the stake, who could easily have said, no, it's okay, I, I, I retract these, these radical beliefs. Um, she could easily have done that, and she chose not to. She was a young woman, but also a young woman who, very different to Anne Boleyn, who was so highly educated and went to France and had every opportunity in a way for a woman at the time. Alice Driver pulled the plough in Grunsborough. Um, she had the most extraordinarily narrow life experience, really, if you look at it in that way. And yet, spiritually, she was the most extraordinary visionary person, really, and, and made this decision to to sacrifice her life. Um, mm. And I suppose I just wanted, I just thought, well, how can I get my head around this idea? And how can I get inside the mind of a woman, a young woman in Grunsborough who would, who would go with this course of action? Yeah, you see, uh, I mean, I remember thinking when I saw the opening, the wonderful opening scenes of Put Out the Lights, all the young people are larking around in a hay barn and they're arguing among themselves. They're going about popish trash and how it was great to burn the statue. Well, no, I rather like the statue. And, you know, there won't be any pilgrimages. There won't be any saints anymore. And I suddenly thought, yeah, actually this woman, Jo, she works with young people all the time. And they were just like a gang of young people now who do talk about things like Europe or Brexit or jihadis or whatever you know they're they're not highly educated but they're bright kids and they know there's stuff going on in the world and they want a good argument about it and they love to take sides and so suddenly we are right there bang in the middle of these long dead past distant mystery historical people who are basically all the kids in one of your groups aren't they yeah they're, modern they're That's, us it, it, yeah it's modern and for them it's cutting edge and and so the, and they want to be at the cutting edge and they they want to be um forming their own ideas and they want to be somebody who thinks about things independently i think and the way they talk about anne boleyn they say oh well she, she was a whore you know yeah. but no friend to the pope <laughs> so, <laughs> she's kind of all right you know they're, they're trying to kind of work it out you know i was saying a bit of a slag you know but really <laughs> yeah, but, but she was but she was great on the environment you know <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> <laughs> totally modern wasn't it um the, there's also of course what what was going on there and again you, you can't help but always pick up a few modern resonances um the protestantism was sort of a bit like a kind a mixture of revolution and nationalism really that to hit with the pope you know pope's you know, we don't want some great Italian bloke in a big hat telling us what to do in our country. And at the same time, it's a bit rebellious. It's sort of, hey, and the idea of sort of Henry's Protestant revolution as a rebel, a rebel yell, that, that came out of that play for me very much. You know, they, there's an excitement. In it. Yeah, so much of that, I think, is uh, with Alice Driver, is about having the Bible in English and, and having your own relationship with God. And through the Pope um, and through the Catholic uh, priests, it was always them uh, interceding between you and God. 
and I think what they got really excited about that in the first scenes as it just as, as the children they're, they're reading the Bible um, and they're they're learning to read that literacy is new and exciting and it's it's like a code unlocking the voice of God for them and so that they can have their own personal relationship with God. So it's quite, it's quite radical. And I think coming from the, the working people, the rural farming people, but actually giving them an opportunity to have that relationship with God. To me, that was very, very important. And I've just recently been looking at the next century. So um, doing a lot of work around the witch trials and trying to reconcile the idea of the Puritans and what they became in the 17th century with the Protestant mm -hmm. martyrs, Alice Driver. And I just thought these don't, they don't fit. They don't seem the same, although geographically mm -hmm. it's, it's the same place. What's happened? And it feels to me somehow as if Protestantism has been taken over by the middle classes in the 17th century and they're all mm. terribly full of themselves and oh um, if you're poor it's a punishment from God and you deserved it and these these are things that I just can't hear in, in somebody like Alice Driver a century mm. before. It feels like they got the, the radical new energy but it was kind of almost being being taken over and taken away from the working people. Like, but then then you get this some um, I mean, what's going on in Put on the Lights is this extraordinary business of the boy king dies, Jane Seymour has a baby and dies, uh, the boy king has, well, oh, how long, not very many times, he dies as a child, Jane Grey has nine days as queen, um, and then you have Bloody Mary, then you have Catholic Bloody Mary, and this enormous, terrifying switch around a completely different, different terror, the one which burns Alice Driver. I mean, that is, I mean, I, I've always, I was raised a Catholic and, and um, you know, the Reformation and how it all happened, it skated over Bloody Mary. This <laughs> tended not to be mentioned by the nuns very much. <laughs> the history teacher may have had a go at it occasionally. And we moved on to the Thirty Years' War quite quickly. But um, a quite extraordinary, extraordinary, cruel, mad time that was, wasn't it? Um, those burnings if she had no no time at all and and you know this, this utter bullying which brings us to the mini play the short play understanding edward which i've only just seen oh, no, no. <laughs> who once lived in your very building in Gipswick yes. hall as and i had known about the fact that he was a devoted catholic and he was a supporter of bloody mary and he was thrilled by the burning of the people in Ipswich who had stuck to Protestantism. Um, he argues this with the fictional young historian in, in your little quite light-hearted play. He just pitches up as a ghost. Everyone should watch this. And, and she sort of argues with him as a modern, you know, how could you, how, how could you be so horrible? <laughs> and again, this is, this is in a lighter way. This is you having to get into his head and yeah. try and work out how a decent, pleasant young man in pleasant Tudor clothes could be absolutely thrilled to see his fellow townsfolk being burnt to death. <laughs> how? I suppose because the, 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 they felt aggrieved and they felt um, as recusant Catholics that they, that they were being disenfranchised completely. And suddenly Mary comes along and she's, she's on their side and she's their champion. It's, it's a little bit like your party winning the election. Pose, only much 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 more so um, <laughs> well, it seems people still sticking up for Boris <laughs> whatever he might do he can do anything <laughs> oh I just find it confusing <laughs> <laughs> don't, join, don't join in that one no but it, it is I mean actually get go back let's, let's sort of say people there are still people who uh, well there were still people who felt Stalin could really do no wrong um, you know, and they took a great deal of, of uh, evidence. But that was that was an interesting little jeu d'esprit to um, try and make him understandable. Did, had you known straight away when when the company and you know you first moved into Gipswick Hall as a company that, that there was this history? No, no, we had to dig for it really um, and find out about him. Um, and yeah, it was it was it was lots of fun and and involving all the groups and the participants in that story was really lovely. <laughs> Um, I think my, my were they were they shocked? I mean, when you were doing when you were doing workshops with it, were were the young people sort of rather rather shocked and horrified at his attitudes? I, don't, I I'm not sure they were. <laughs> <laughs> 
I think, I think in a way, people expect people from the past to be cruel, don't they? Um, mm. I think, I think we think of public executions and people shouting and jeering and getting involved and excited in that. And in a way that feels like the way they were then. But yes, I think I, I was, I, I'm afraid I'm not a fan of horrible histories. I don't know whether you are or not, but I don't like it because it just seems to be taking lots of gruesome stuff with absolutely zero understanding. You know, then when you come to more serious plays, you know, like, like yours or like some of the ones they've done at Stratford, you know, you, you have more of a shudder. You think actually these are us. You know, these are us too. I, I agree with you. I mean, having Ted when he was little and watching Horrible History sort of converted me because it was really fun and he really enjoyed it and it gives you a starting point to talk about things. And some of them just are very, very funny, like they're Aztecs songs. Um, <laughs> we can sort I, of do with Az Aztecs, all right, they were longer ago and in a foreign <laughs> country. It, it's our I, own lot. I came, I came along... At the, in the beginning, I felt exactly the way you, you were describing and just been quite, quite horrified by it. And, I, you know, I was a sort of teenager who went to Pompeii and cried. Um, <laughs> I've always been really interested in empathising with people from the past and, and seeing mm. them as human and trying to get inside the psychology of that moment. And to me, it's really interesting. And I, I suppose, you know, frivolously saying, oh, just I'm interested in Anne Boleyn, but I was interested in a woman going through something really scary as well. Mm. And just the idea of how, how brave she had to be to endure what she endured. Well, let's go on in years then to the third play, which oddly enough is when I came across of yours first, Progress, 1561, Queen Elizabeth visiting Ipswich, uh, with her famous desire not to look into men's hearts. You know, she, she did, she seems to have pragmatically seen, you know, daughter of a Spanish Catholic herself and, and of a Protestant king. She, she was just saying, let's actually, <laughs> let's finish with all this and get on with some building a navy and stuff. Um, <laughs> but, um, uh, she, so there she is, and she comes on a progress in 1561 to Ipswich, and everyone's excited and you cleverly alternated the same cast playing courtiers around Elizabeth and herself and the locals in Ipswich. So in a way, the two previous groups come together they, you know, from two previous plays, but they're played by the same people. Um, and the emotional and religious cruelties still hanging on there. People are remembering. They're remembering people who died in the burnings. They're remembering both sides, you know, the, the chaos and cruelty of both sides, of the, the burning of the statue of the Virgin Mary and then the burning of the actual, you know, the actual Catholic worshippers. I mean, that's, I, in a funny way, it's the most painful of the plays, really, because it's just things hanging on and hanging on in what seems to be a good time. It's, it's very, very moving. 1558 was Alice Driver was burnt and 1561 so we're only three years later yeah and, um and that community which is down by the docks the Ipswich waterfront um the tailor's shop there uh the working people they're all real people aren't they that you've found people, yeah. and they you know, the, the the old guy when he says I I saw the burnings and and he describes it um uh, he really did. He really saw those those people die. And now we ha we've moved into a new time, and they have the new queen. And the new the new queen has brought this um, this peace and taken that danger and that fear away. And she's coming. She's coming to visit. She's coming along the River Orwell, um, and she's coming to see them. And it's such an incredibly beautiful feeling. I think that they have of wanting to kind of it's a royal visit with a real difference so for them it means everything and she means yeah. everything. Yeah the moment that holds is still in my head which um, I had to look it up in my review to see if I make sure I was getting it right but actually it's been in my head for a few years was Lizzie the orphan seamstress who also plays Elizabeth and the other half she says I wish my mother had lied like you that actually you could get out of quite a lot of this burning you know, mm. like the poor cobbler who was killed in another village in, in Suffolk, you mm. could sort of get out of being persecuted and burnt just by lying to yourself and your own yes. soul and, and pretending. Yeah. And again, how... Which is what I would have done. And, and 
<laughs> you know, and, and looking back historically is what lots of people, the majority of people, towed the line. They didn't want to be burnt at the stake. But it's those people who decided to say, no, I'm, I'm not going to compromise my immortal soul. They really believed that that, that was that. And, and OK, they had to go through this hideous torture, but they were going to go and be saved immortally. And, and they absolutely believed that. And then they had the courage to go through with it. And the locals, of course, there was, there was a village in Suffolk, wasn't there, where the, where the local cobbler was, was due to be burnt. And the entire village just made it difficult for the executioners by putting all their fires out. You know, people <laughs> used to keep in their fire for 24 hours, and they simply put all their fires out. So they had to go to another village and kindle some more in order to do the execution. There must have been so much general disgust around at what was happening, you know, whichever side you were on. I mean, people like, like poor Edward, you know, who couldn't quite get over his passion for Queen Mary, and so he <laughs> approved it. But on the whole, it, I mean, it makes you think, and it suddenly makes you think of things like, like Iraq now, like the Middle East now, that there must be a lot of people who are saying, yeah, I disapprove of people being gay, but they shouldn't be throwing them off buildings. You know, I, the, 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 it it keeps on. Do you, do you find, or did you find, writing these plays and then the news being on in the evening at home, suddenly all these echoes, the bigotries and the beheadings and the burnings and the jihadis and and so on, and even even modern politics in a less bloodthirsty way. It it, it echoes. The history just echo all the time, doesn't it? Yes, and, and I wanted to explore radicalism, really, um, but without doing it in a really kind of obvious way, um, by just understanding our capacity as human beings to feel those things and to behave in those ways. Mm. And you working a lot with, with young people, does this, does this resonate with them as well? I mean, when, when you're doing your work in the community and with young people, I mean, do you, do you, do you always find that, that these echoes are quite easy to raise? Yes, I do. And, and especially with our um, adult community company as well, um, with uh, working with disabled people and people caring for disabled people and also people with mental health issues. Um, I've been particularly struck with that recently, uh, working on the witch trials subject. Um, I wrote half a scene for my community group. We've been doing lots of writing on remotely, which is really exciting. They're doing amazing work. But I, I wrote half a scene, which is somebody um, ostracising somebody within the community. There's nothing specific mm -hmm. about it. And they have to fill in the other half of the scene. Um, and they've come back with the most extraordinary work. And one, um, one of my participants, Leanne, who's extraordinary, and she's the mother of a severely, profoundly disabled boy. He's a, a wonderful participant of ours, Mark. And she wrote the, her half of the scene just as it was a modern day scene and Mark had spat at somebody in the street. And mm -hmm. they, the way they'd reacted to him spitting in the street. Um, and it was, it was, really interchangeable with something happening in 17th century village mm. in Suffolk. Um, mm. well, yes, they do. They, they, they really respond. And, and I've, I've also found with, the, with our young people who did um, the play about the witch trials recently um, and, and working with them on Zoom with youth theatre sessions now, um, just thinking about the, the extremity of what we're going through. I mm. think they've, they've been they've had a new perspective on it because of their deep understanding of the extreme times in the civil war and the witch trials. And um, mm. yeah. So on you go with another witch trials play now, I think uh, a longer witch trials play yeah. because we, we love the last one. Well, that's sort of about it really, but it's, I mean, it seems to me that one of the extra values of what you do at Red Rose is that, uh, is that, it's happened on these streets, on these pavements, by this river. I love the Puritan thing in the witch trials play where rowing was not allowed, or that the, no, no, no unnecessary boat trips on the river. You couldn't just go for a row. You had to be going somewhere important. Sort of, it was just pre-lockdown and then suddenly we were all told not to do anything unnecessary. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, Nothing the feeling that. that that on these, on, these, on these stones, on these pavements, under this same sky, you know, with this same basic landscape, it all happened. History is now and forever. And uh, there's a magic in that, isn't there? Yeah. Yeah. But it's Red Rose Chain Magic, and I say, Joanna Carrick, thank you. 
Thank you, Libby. <laughs> Thank you so much.